Good evening, and thank you for joining our conversation tonight. My name is Monica Sandschaefer, and I am the District Director for Congressman Ruben Gallego. During this webinar, we will have five presenters who will talk briefly about the changes that districts are implementing and the process of reopening, child coping mechanisms, and how to help children of all ages through this pandemic and transition back to school as well as resources for bridging the digital divide and keeping education going at home. The Congressman was going to join us this evening, but unfortunately he was called back to DC for an in-person briefing. However, he did record a video that we will be playing for you in just a moment. Following the, present, the video and the presentations, we will answer pre-submitted questions. Again, you can begin asking your questions at any time at the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Know that we may not get to all of the questions. However, our office will follow up with you. And of course, you can always reach us at the information listed on the screen. Our email is az07services at mail.house.gov. Our website is rubengallego.house.gov and our Phoenix phone number is 602-256-0551. Please reach out anytime. And if you vis do visit the, our website, you will also find a variety of resources related to COVID as well as other federal issues. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started with Congressman Gallego's video greeting. As Arizona continues its work to turn the tide in this pandemic, my colleagues and I in Washington are working every single day to ensure that students, parents, and educators have the resources they need to meet the challenges of this moment successfully. I will continue to advocate for our schools to receive the resources necessary to safely navigate Arizona's rapidly evolving public health crisis. The Arizona Department of Education has received, has received CARES funding to, to address these challenges due to COVID-19. Yet I'm still extremely concerned about the situation facing our students and parents in Arizona. The lack of internet access and devices creates a digital barrier for many families to attend school. Additional federal dollars will be critical to our teachers' success and students in the upcoming school year. Part of the challenge for parents is the uncertainty about how severe the crisis will be in our community and when it is appropriate for school to start. Today's webinar will provide answers to some of the many questions parents currently have. And I'd like to thank our panelists for participating tonight. Erica Maxwell, Associate Superintendent of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion with the Arizona Department of Education. Marisol Garcia, Vice President of the Arizona Education Association. Dr. Michael Robert, Superintendent at Osborne Elementary. Dr. Deanna Donegan, uh, Medical Director and Pediatrician with Native Health. And last but not least, Tracy Beal, Executive Director at School Connect. Thank you for everyone being here. I hope this is a valuable uh, panel uh, for our parents and for everyone else participating. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And now we'll get started with our first presenter, as the Congressman said, Ms. Erica Maxwell, who is the Arizona Department of Education's first ever Associate Superintendent of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Ms. Maxwell has over 25 years of experience as a certified educator. Her experience includes roles as an administrator in the Chandler Unified School District, instructional coach at Skyline Gila River, an adjunct faculty member at Chandler Gilbert Community College and faculty associate at Arizona State University. In addition to her work experience, Ms. Maxwell co-founded the Arizona Multicultural Education Conference in 2011, and in 2013, she founded a free summer reading club for Chandler students. She also received the 2015 East Valley NAACP Education Advocacy Award. Ms. Maxwell, could you please get us started? Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, and taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, and I just want to start and go back to March 15th, uh, when Superintendent Hoffman, uh, along with Governor Ducey, uh, made the very, very difficult decision to close uh, 
cancel in-person classes, I should say, for the remainder of the school year um, for 2019-2020. It was a very difficult decision. And as a parent of a senior and a uh, sophomore, um, my son has since graduated, it, it definitely was a challenge to really process that the school year and that my son's senior year and my daughter's sophomore year would not uh, be the same, right? Um, would not be traditional. But what I took comfort in knowing is that uh, the Arizona education community came together uh, rapidly to acclimate and, and provide um, a new learning environment for our students. Um, and as we realize and know that there were already inequities that uh, were present in our educational systems, not only here in Arizona, but around the country, um, they became exacerbated at that point in time. Um, but we made sure that we provided some flexibility and accountability to ensure again that students uh, kept learning um, in a new environment. There were and still are a multitude of challenges to overcome, um, but we had, again, come together to start uh, running. You know, we had a, a start. We were in the midst of it happening and planning for something in the midst of it. Um, and we quickly put out guidance to support our LEAs, families, uh, students and communities, again, with the goal of ensuring that learning kept uh, going forward. Um, so we have tools that we need and we, we created a toolbox and a plethora of resources which can be found at azed.gov. Um, and many of those resources are in Spanish. Um, we are now working and have provided guidance and a roadmap to reopening schools, which has since been uh, delayed um, as far as in-person um, school and students coming in person to receive educational services to um, August 17th at this time. So we want students to return to school as soon as is safely possible. And that is the, the key word. Uh, what is safe for our students um, in the environment uh, that they are used to within a brick and mortar environment? Um, we all have a role to play. Um, and we know in the news, unfortunately, Arizona is in a place of um, adverse um, impact of the virus um, at higher rates than in other places in the country. And so we are always reinforcing uh, the CDC guidelines as far as staying home, washing hands, physical distancing, wearing masks in public. And the reopening of schools relies on those um, items happening from the entire community. We continue to work closely with many of our stakeholders and organizations, including the Arizona Department of Health Services, uh, the governor's office, to provide schools with flexibility around instructional models. We know it has been challenging as an understatement um, to provide distance learning, um, hybrid models, and when safe, again, we want to have students return to the classroom. We continue to provide clarification and guidance um, to help schools and districts make the best decisions for their communities. Um, next week, we are hosting a webinar to school leaders to provide more information to assist them when making decisions that keep students and, edu and educators safe while providing high quality learning uh, opportunities. And this also includes the financial portion of online learning as opposed to in-person. Um, that has been lots of questions around that. Um, and then I, I would uh, cannot fail to mention the added concern for students of color amidst the continued uh, murders of unarmed Black men and women. 
Um, so social emotional learning um, and competencies are being created for the state and should be um, rolled out, I believe in August. They're, they're moving right along with that because we are not just, we don't have to just plan for the physical return of students. We have to consider and are considering their uh, social emotional needs. Um, and so it has been an, um, an overwhelming at times task, but again, uh, these are uncharted waters in which we at the ADE, our team, uh, along with other agencies and their teams are really navigating and on board with ensuring students, um, educators and communities are safe uh, prior to uh, and as we reopen. So that, that's all I have for right now. I'm sure there are lots of questions. And, and one of the things that we have realized as an agency and, and the communities have been giving us a lot of grace is we don't have all of the answers. Um, we are all figuring this out together. And that is the key word together um, and community and their hard decisions uh, to make. So, um, as, and I'm feeling it as, not only as an educator, but as a parent, uh, again, in, in this realm, uh, many realms that we, and challenges we are facing. Absolutely, thank you so much, Ms. Maxwell. Um, and as you mentioned, so many of the decisions need to be made at the local level. Um, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Robert, Dr. Michael Robert, who serves as the superintendent of the Osborne School District. Prior to being named superintendent, Dr. Robert was principal of Encanto School for 10 years as it became an A-rated school and then was honored as an A-plus school of excellence by the Arizona Educational Foundation. Dr. Robert was a teacher in public Montessori, bilingual, dual language, and early childhood settings in California, Arizona, and abroad for 12 years before becoming an assistant principal, principal, and now superintendent. Dr. Robert? Thank you so much for the, there we go trying to turn on my volume and I turned off my face at the same time. Thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, be able to, to address everyone tonight. Um, I'm coming to you as a, a superintendent of a, of a local school district here within the, the congressional district. Um, very proud superintendent of Osborne School District. I'm also a very proud parent, a uh, public school parent. I, I just sent off my oldest uh, to college on, on Sunday. Um, but I've, I've got three more high schoolers at home that all attend Phoenix Union High School District. So um, I'm all about uh, what we do in public schools from my work responsibilities to my parent responsibilities, um, public schools. We found out, um, if we didn't know it before, we certainly found out on March 15th um, with everyone recognizing that schools are the hub of the community. And so when, when schools closed um, at, at the outbreak of this pandemic, um, we recognized, number one, one of, the, one of the very first things that we did was getting meals out to families that rely on us five days a week um, for breakfast and lunch. Um, as learning opportunities, you know, we were having, needing to reach out for learning opportunities. Many of our students needed a device on which to work, so getting Chromebooks, working with families on connectivity to the internet. So that digital divide that, um, that we've been talking about. Um, just that those social emotional learning, those connections that our kids needed, especially in the midst, like, like uh, Ms. Maxwell, Ms. Maxwell was talking about with what is happening um, within our society and, and seeing um, what's happening with uh, the taking of lives of, of innocent young um, African-American men um, that, that we've witnessed. And now um, we've seen something more recently happen with a young Latino man within uh, the Phoenix neighborhoods. Um, our schools need us as, as a support to them. And we were able to be that support 
one of the first things that we did over the first few weeks within the pandemic was make sure we were making those connections with our families, meeting those social emotional needs, meeting those um, household needs that, that families rely on, on their schools for. And then we were able to, in the, in the later weeks, get more into the academic um, connections that we were able to make. But it was a rough go during the spring. And hopefully as we move into the fall, we'll be approaching education in a much different way. Since March, I've had weekly meetings. You know, we are, we are one of 13 elementary um, school districts that feeds into the Phoenix Union High School District. And since March, I've had weekly uh, Zoom meetings with um, all 14 of us superintendents within the uh, greater Phoenix area have been meeting weekly, talking about what we could do to get through from March to May, talking about what we were, are doing in terms of making plans from June and July so far. Um, and we'll continue those conversations as we look to, to making sure that we're meeting our community's needs. And, and so what you've probably heard from all of your school districts, you, I'm sure you've heard from all of them, is that every school district has been putting together task forces. Um, here within Osborne, we had five different task forces looking at school operations, district operations, teaching and learning, early childhood education, um, our special area teachers, working on what is school going to look like in the fall. And I think most districts are coming down to seeing that there are pretty much two options um, when we have the opportunity to get back in school, that parents will have an online opportunity. We're, we're beginning something that's called the Osborne Community iSchool. So it's a virtual learning opportunity for families that are choosing to continue learning virtually. And if we get to that point, um, the, the governor's executive order um, making the, the start of in-school learning waiting until at least um, August 17th. Eventually we'll get to in-person learning um, within Osborne. You know, we're, we're talking about an in-person, socially distanced, um, looking at all the safety features all throughout um, the entire day, being able to contact trace, being able to check for, um, to make sure that everyone is coming to school and not feeling sick and, and making sure that we're able to do um, everything that we can to keep everyone safe from staff to uh, children to community members and having to make a lot of hard decisions. It's exhausting work with changes and plans happening almost on a, on a daily basis and also needing to weigh so many different aspects, needing to weigh um, the needs of parents. Our parents, need to work and they rely on their children being at school for them to provide a living. So that in and of itself becomes an equity concern when our families aren't able to provide a living for, for their families um, with, with schools not being open. Our, our schools are also a large employer. Um, you know, we have, we're a small district, but that's still 450 people that when we're not open, um, if we're not able to be open, you know, that there are that many more people that um, are reliant on us for, for a paycheck. Um, we are their livelihood. But also needing to, besides livelihood for our parents and our staff, there's the safety aspect of keeping all of our parents, keeping all of our students, keeping all of our staff safe. And so there hasn't been any easy decisions that have been made over the past couple months. Um, I'd say one of the hardest aspects of this is doing a full day's work going home, getting a good night's sleep, waking up and starting from scratch. That's what it feels like we're doing these days because the pandemic is asking for so much flexibility from us and um, response to the changing nature. Um, you know, and one, in, one example of that is I was prepared to give a, a, an address to the entire Osborne community on the day that the governor announced an executive order. And some of the things that I had been planning for four weeks that I was going to talk with the community about had to change just within that day and more is coming, you know, as we're, as we're moving forward. One of the hardest things within all of this, I, I'm, I'll just finish up here. Um, safety has to be the most important thing. The economy is, is of course important. I've talked about the need for our families to, to make a living, but it's more important for our families to be alive and be together. And so safety has to come first. Um, we worked this past year within Osborne on a new strategic plan, and one of our core values we identified is integrity, which is doing the right thing even when it's hard. Um, and right now, we're looking at that start of school date of August 17th, 
And looking at the numbers in Arizona right now, it doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel right. And so we are really struggling with this idea of, although we may be looking at August 17th as a going back to school date, is that really the right thing to do? And so we are, we are pushing our core values and our integrity. I'm being challenged by my staff. I'm being challenged by my teachers to be a leader. Um, and, and I'm challenging my leaders um, to be leaders as well. And so we've got we've to put safety first. And so I'm talking with my board. I just got off right before this, talking with our administrative team. And there may be more changes. Um, we, we need to make safety first, but part of that safety for our community is, is also providing for the social emotional needs, the academic needs, and, and being who we can be for our community. So it's, um, it's been a really hard time to be a superintendent, but it's even harder to be a parent that's waiting to find out what's going to happen. Harder to be a teacher that's wondering what's gonna happen to me, do I have to choose between my career and my health? Um, so I, I, to everyone out there in the community, Please be patient with your schools right now. We're all trying our best. These are such hard decisions and I, I have trouble sleeping these days because the decisions weigh on me so heavily. But we're going to do the right thing. Um, but please keep giving us your input. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Marisol Garcia. Marisol Garcia is the elected vice president of the Arizona Education Association. With more than 20,000 members, the Arizona Education Association is the largest professional association for public school employees in Arizona. The AEA is a leader in advocating for support of Arizona's public schools, improving the quality of public education through positive change, and improving the professional lives of teachers and school staff members. Ms. Garcia? Thank you so much and good, good evening to everyone. Hope you had a very safe day. Um, just wanted to give a chance, have a chance to um, share with you some of um, the teacher perspective on the reopening of schools. Um, first, want to just make it very clear that as schools, uh, buildings closed in the spring, um, educators from across the state continue to work. Um, some of them worked double the amount of hours that they were working when they used to walk into a classroom to support their students. And that was because we were asked to engage in what we call crisis distance learning. This global pandemic was nothing that we were prepared for. And so the initial few weeks were spent on trying to figure out how are we going to connect with our kids that, that is meaningful, but also provide the very basic needs that a lot of our students need. And that means everything from a safe environment, if they are not living in one, to food insecurity that is rampant um, in our community, and then to make sure that they had some sort of way of connecting to school. And so most cases that included the internet. Um, and for a lot of our students, especially where um, I come from in the Isaac School District, um, there wasn't enough one-on-one -on -one devices, nor were there any um, broadband connected to the homes that they lived in. So even if there was an ability to get it, um, there wasn't, the, the community was not built for that. So teachers had to find a new way, as they always do, to do with le le least resources possible. And as this was happening came um, just the fear of being ill and getting sick and staying home um, and making sure that their families were, were safe. Um, most importantly, what the teachers wanted to do is they wanted to take this as an opportunity to bring to light all of the, the lack of prioritization of schools, public schools in the state, so that we could use this as a way of helping parents understand how vital schools and teachers, bus drivers, cross, crosswalk workers are, and how much we are a part of their family. And we saw that, a lot of you saw the commercials thanking teachers and, and social media tiles, I'll pay teachers a million dollars. We're gonna hold you to that because the work is gonna continue. But what we also did as a union is we came together and decided to create um, a new vision and see this as an opportunity to recreate Arizona schools in a way that was visionary, in a way that allowed people to say, you know, if we get a chance to rebuild, re-architect these schools, what are the priorities? What do we need to see so that if this happens again, we are prepared? 
Um, but most importantly, we wanted to make sure from the very beginning when this uh, work was published, this vision, this task force that we created, was that no employee of a school should be walking into an unsafe environment. That's a very core belief of not only union, but, but how we believe um, as our profession. We keep kids safe every day from all kinds of things, whether it's something flying across the room, somebody running down the hall, food being thrown, <clears throat> or somebody coming into the school that shouldn't be there. Our priority is to keep kids safe. And in return, we need to make sure that our colleagues are safe. And so we wanted to make sure that um, we laid a line in the sand that said no employee should be entering a school building, a school facility, unless there is an insurance that they're safe. And that is exactly modeled for students. We cannot have a student enter our building knowing that they are unsafe. And so as the work progressed, we made it very clear that there are sufficient needs that need to be filled in this state. There is a clear difference of the have and have nots of students who are in dire need of food, they're living in insecurity, of instability, um, aside from the technology, but just having a safe place to live. We also made a focus to really talk about how our schools curriculum needs to be reflective of what's in the school, who's in the school. And so that became a priority. We needed to make sure that as teachers entered contracts to work, that there is flexibility aligned with if a teacher gets ill, if a paraprofessional gets ill. Um, particularly, there is a concern that some of our classified employees, some of our employees that you um, as parents may see every single day who are not 12-month employees are ineligible for unemployment insurance. And more importantly, as schools reopened, the resources that are going to be needed to ensure that we are following CDC guidelines, we are completely lacking. Now, the federal government, as the congressman mentioned, did pass the Initial CARES Act, but that was to deal with the right now and it was to deal with the four months since the pandemic. It was not to deal with what we are faced with in the future. And so we, there is a need from the federal government and from the state government to come together and figure out how are we gonna enforce the very basic thing that we've heard from the very beginning, which is wash your hands and social distance. Now, the, my last social studies class, my last period of my class was always the biggest, and I had 38 kids in that classroom. It is impossible to physical distance that classroom. And every single one of those children would be susceptible to another child being ill. And if that child gets ill and gets my class ill, then goes home and get all those families ill, it would take less than a week to spread this virus twice as bad as it currently is. So there have been really great conversations happening locally, as you heard the superintendent speak about. But we need to be very clear is that um, teachers are vulnerable as well. And so we do have a lot of teachers with pre-existing conditions. We have secretaries that have lived with their grandparents or their parents. We have uh, cafeteria workers that live with multi-generational homes. And so they are susceptible to the virus. The virus is going to really control our ability to move forward. What we are doing as a union with this new vision work, with this task force work, is really work in each local district. You know, today the governor made it very clear. I'm not going to say anything else beyond what I initially said, which is to not have children in a school till the 17th. However, at a local district, as parents, you should be reaching out and working with your local school districts, with your principals, with your local superintendents, to really let them know what you feel needs to happen as we move forward. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much, Ms. Garcia. And thank you to both you and, uh, and Dr. Robert. You make uh, excellent points about the importance of teachers and school staff, as well as the schools themselves for keeping students and families uh, safe, educated, and, and fed. So we, we very much do appreciate the efforts of you all this spring during very unprecedented times. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Diana Dunnigan. Dr. Dunnigan is a pediatrician at Native Health. Prior to joining Native Health, Dr. Dunnigan served as chief clinical consultant for pediatrics at the Indian Health Service and was chief of pediatric services at Phoenix Indian Medical Center. Dr. Dunnigan earned her medical degree at the Uniformed Services University and served in the commissioned corps of the US Public Health Service for 16 years. Dr. Dunnigan, 
Thank you, Monica. And hi, everybody. Um, as Monica said, I'm the medical director at Native Health, but my heart is really in pediatrics and I am a practicing pediatrician, which I have been for 22 years now. Um, I'm also a parent. I had a graduating senior this year and I have a rising junior. So um, I, I empathize with what everybody's going through with the school issues. What I've been asked to discuss is a little bit different though. It's, um, I've been asked to discuss how to help the children with um, coping with the stress of COVID. And this is something, it's very different from anything that we've ever experienced and all the kids are experiencing it together but in different ways. And children don't always let you know that they're stressed and they don't always let you know that they know that you're stressed. So I, they're very perceptive of how we're feeling. And some of the ways that children let us know that they're stressed, especially the school age kids is um, they'll be restless. So just really unable to sit still um, many times they have sleep issues. They might not have, they might have trouble falling asleep. They might not be able to stay asleep. They might have nightmares. Um, frequent crying often happens. Um, the younger children get clingy and they show fear. Um, they also sometimes will do repetitive play where they're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, some children will represent their stress by aggression or anger. Um, and some become really more withdrawn where they're really not communicating with their parent or caregivers at all. And then with some children, we see regression. So you might have a, you know, a first grader who's suddenly having issues with toilet training or um, a kindergartner who wants to use a bottle and baby talks. So those are the things that we kind of see. And as parents and caregivers, where our responsibility is really to support these children and help them cope in ways that are important. Um, one of the things for children is routines. And I'm active in the American Academy of Pediatrics as well. And they recently put out a statement encouraging um, children to be able to go to school. Obviously it needs to be done safely, which is part of the reason that it's so important that we follow the guidelines of social distancing and trying to prevent the spread of, of COVID. Um, so um, very important to have routines. And you can do routines at home as well. So having the children get up at the same time every day, having meals together as families, um, having structured activities for the kids, and art, um, writing, different things according to their age. Trying to keep them from, you know, just having no routine at all. Um, support is really important and they need, you know, really emotional availability from their parents. And it's important to explain to them why things are different. And they might not ask, but they know that things are different. So you can explain, you know, why you're not being able to see your grandparent or why you can't go to your friend's house in ways that are simple, not too complicated. I would avoid watching the news with them um, and just answer any questions that they do have in a very honest, basic manner. Um, that probably one of the more important things is self-care. So really taking care of yourselves as parents and caregivers, um, because you, the children really do recognize the stress that you're under. And if, if they sense the stress, then they're gonna feel it more. And so really taking the time to, whatever it is that you need to do to feel better, like try to eat well, exercise, get everybody outside if you can in a way that's safe, just walking around the neighborhood, um, has to be very early in the morning these days or late in the evening, um, but walking around the neighborhood together, um, a little bit of sun exposure is good for children and good for their moods. And um, if you meditate, make sure you're getting plenty of sleep yourself. Those are the important things that we can do to help support our children moving forward. And I'm interested to see if there's any questions or anything. And that's kind of all I really have to say. Thank you, Monica. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Dunnigan. Our children have definitely been going through a lot of changes, um, which can be tricky for all of us. Um, next, we have Ms. Beal. Ms. Beal is the, Ms. Tracy Beal, excuse me, is the Executive Director of School Connect, where she creates dynamic partnerships among faith, business, government, and nonprofit organizations in support of local schools. This collaborative, model was born in the Washington Elementary School District and is multiplying through districts in the Greater Valley of Phoenix. Tracy also serves as the pastor of Community Development at Pure Heart Church, 
where she oversees all of their local community initiatives in partnership with numerous community organizations. Tracy, please take it away. Thank you so much. I'm loved to be here this evening. Um, when COVID-19 hit, um, obviously uh, one of the things that was highlighted uh, was the digital divide. And that is something that has been around for a long time. But in that crisis, we began to recognize that while some school districts had computers, so often uh, students and families did not have access to internet at home. And so that huge divide um, was something that really needed to be addressed. And the digital divide is really a three-pronged problem. Uh, one of those is, of course, computers themselves having computers not only at home, I mean at school, but also at home. The, the next part of that is having internet. Um, so you actually have broadband so that you can access um, all the learning that you need to. And then the third one is really tech support that makes sure that those students and families are really able to access um, all of it together. And so um, in Arizona, uh, the numbers are, are pretty uh, astonishing. Uh, there are about 100,000 students, at least, that do not have computers and possibly twice as many students who do not have internet. And so um, those areas, those students that have the greatest need in Arizona would be in the, um, the, in the high poverty areas of the urban part of uh, different cities in Phoenix and then the rural communities and the tribal lands as well. So when School Connect, uh, who brings community partners together as a village to support schools, when we saw the digital divide being highlighted, we began to connect with school districts and say, which of your families do not have computers and internet? And then we also connected with a wonderful nonprofit called um, Computers to Kids that provided Lenovo touchscreen laptops with Microsoft licenses and then a, a year of free tech support at a, an incredible price. And then we worked with providers like the Cox Communications Connect to Compete program or AT&T. And what we did is we brought those, all those partners together. So we had local businesses, nonprofits, foundations who put together funding and then we brought them to um, a, a physical distancing uh, distribution site. So there were specific appointments for families. And um, while we were there, then a family would receive a computer and then have the chance to sign up for internet. And uh, while there, I met a young woman, uh, a young girl who was 14, Brazelda, and uh, she did not have a computer or internet uh, right in the middle of COVID-19. And I said, what does that feel like for you? And she said, you know, it feels like you're blind and deaf like you don't have access to know what's happening. You can't get connected. And so um, getting to be involved in that, both on the ground as well as um, at the, the um, broadband task force level, at the state level, um, also on uh, Superintendent Kathy Hoffman's broadband task force as well, you start to understand that, that boy, there are um, there are resources, there's infrastructure that is needed to really help every single child have internet and a computer in the state of Arizona. But there are also um, kind of those crisis decisions we have to make and the mid-level uh, decisions we have to make. And so one of the things that we are, um, we're working on in the community is as we understand from school districts, who are their families that still don't have internet um, as we're going to online learning, the superintendent described uh, in early August with the potential then of going to in-person learning a little bit later, um, our thought process is how do we help those families get connected? And we're very excited about gathering volunteers from the community. Uh, first of all, to connect families to internet resources that would be affordable. Um, those, there are some great programs out there but also working um, with public libraries and public uh, buildings that would have internet where we can create a map. And, and I have that map. I included um, those resources um, in the um, information that I was giving this evening. Um, and so having a map of where you can go to get 
internet and, and how you can get computers and actually work on schoolwork in a safe uh, way um, using physical distancing again um, and masks as we do that, but giving them an opportunity to uh, really have the chance uh, to get their education. And I, and I also want to point out that families uh, also need the same support, obviously, not only children who are um, doing education, but for telehealth, for job creation, for all kinds of resources. We're working together to help that happen. Thank you, Monica. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ms. Beal. Uh, essential services during this virtual uh, reality that we're in. Thank you. And now we'll go ahead and start our Q&A portion of this conversation. We ask that you uh, continue to submit your questions if you have those. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. As some participants did pre-submit questions, we'll go ahead and start with those first and then we'll move on to the questions presently being submitted. Again, if we don't get to your question, please know that, that we will make sure that uh, a member of our team follows up and also share the questions with the panelists here so they can reach out to you. The first question I'd like to go ahead and direct to Ms. Maxwell uh, and then Dr. Robert. Uh, it, obviously, if other folks uh, would like to, to weigh in, please feel free. What is the plan for an in-person classroom if a teacher is required to quarantine themselves due to a possible exposure? Well, I'll hop in there. Um, in, in looking at our at our um, different plans that we've come through, we've been using um, guidance from from the trust guidance. You know, the roadmap through that we got from ADE. Um, lots of documents, but the idea of, of a teacher um, becoming ill and, and covering that classroom can take on many different um, looks because one of those questions is what if that teacher became found out that they were ill during a time that they had been with their with students in their classroom um, so that's that's question number one um, one of the ways that we've uh, addressed that so basically what happens if there's a positive case of COVID on on the the school campus. Um, the procedure we have for, for that right now is that clearly that classroom would need to um, go into, into quarantine. Both the teacher and the students that were exposed would have to go into a quarantine for, for two weeks. We do have our, um, our iSchool that is starting up, so students would be able to access learning through the iSchool during the time that they're, that they're quarantined. But then the question becomes even greater and should be, um, this is not something that school districts should be figuring out and be happening different from one district to the next. And so we're looking for some greater uh, leadership from, from the, the Department of Ed as well as from um, Department of Health uh, Services is what if there's a need uh, or uh, an infection in one classroom how and you contact trace what if they came in touch with someone else within the school dish within the school at what point would a school a classroom closure lead to a school closure or a school closure you know we're five schools and we have one middle school if something happens at our middle school that's connected to all of our elementary schools so at what point would that closure go from a classroom at our middle school to possibly affecting the entire district um, that is not something that district by district should be figuring out. We should have much stronger guidance. Um, and there was, a, there was an ADE webinar that said that they're um, looking to provide more guidance on that in working with um, Department of Health Services. So, we, you know, we're not prepared for that level of being able to provide an answer of this is exactly what it should be. Um, but in terms of a, a singular classroom, we, we do recognize and are creating um, situations when students go back into classrooms that we're able to contact trace um, and I would hope that any school that's looking for opening up in-person learning that there are cohorts of students that you're able to trace um, contact from one person to another from one student to another or student to adult. Thank you Dr. Robert um, and along those lines um, we, in our guidance, our roadmap to reopening schools, 
um, we have specific guidelines, the CDC guidelines, of course, um, and that's the bare minimum. But I think the question is more towards, so what happens with the, within the classroom? Um, but what we have published is regarding the CDC's criteria to just, um, when do they come back? How is it communicated to the, the actual um, classroom and community, school community? Um, and so we also, it's really important too for um, all staff members, uh, students and parents to be aware of um, the steps they should take if they think or know that they had COVID-19 with symptoms. Um, it's three days with no fever and respiratory symptoms have improved and 10 days since symptoms first appeared um, prior to discontinuing in home isolation. If they have tested positive for COVID-19 but had no symptoms, um, they, they can be with others after 10 days have passed since the test. Um, and so it's important that that criteria is not communicated at the time it happens, but prior to, um, because if symptoms begin to occur, um, there are guidelines to, to start acting on uh, removing themselves from um, and putting, being isolated at that time. And if they've been around a, a person with COVID-19, it's a stay at home for 14 days after exposure uh, based on the time it takes to develop the illness. Thank you, Ms. Maxwell a and Dr. Robert. I have another question here that I'd like to direct to Dr. Dunnigan and Ms. Maxwell. How can the schools support children who have been affected by COVID-19 and have developed mental illness due to the quarantine? For example, my son developed OCD and anxiety due to the quarantine and COVID. He is currently under psychiatric care. How, I don't know about the school. <laughs> So that has to go to the school people, sorry. That's okay. Um, but That's these, these children, I mean, outside of the school, I think that um, care is needed. So obviously supporting the child at home and um, making sure you're getting them into behavioral health, not just for um, potential medical treatment, but also for counseling. And I know some of the schools do offer counseling, so I was gonna let the school speak on that. Thank you, Dr. Dunnigan. Um, so uh, thank you for that question. And we talked a little bit about the social emotional learning piece. And I just wanted to share um, and answer your question too, that there are uh, there is some initial data in regards to uh, the impact of the COVID-19 on the mental health of our students. Um, there was a, a short survey of 1,500 students um, and 45% uh, did indicate it indicate that they had ex excess stress. 43% st stated that they, or indicated that they had struggled with depression. And more than half of those students uh, that were surveyed uh, experienced anxiety. Um, and this is then also, we have to consider the race-related traumatic events online and the mental health of uh, students of color. Um, has That has also confounded the um, actual situation uh, that we are in with the pandemic. Um, it's so important, so, so important. Um, and I, I notice these things and I talk to people because my 16-year-old my, uh, is home with me. And really, it's important to first of off notice the symptoms, notice what is going on with your um who's under your care are those that are um, under 18 and <laughs> over 18 as well. But also, again, there are resources um, in public health resources. Uh, there is a teen lifeline. Uh, I know specifically the uh, Arizona Department of Education has provided resources to uh, numbers for those in the indigenous communities um, as well. And so there's a, there is a helpline in regards to students can call. Um, you can call as a parent, I believe as well, and, and say, hey, these are, some, these are my concerns and they uh, will provide, um, it's 24 hour service. They have peer counselors. 
um, and texting is available because we know that's how uh, students communicate as well from three to nine o'clock um, so that teens have um, someone to talk to, to listen, to help, and they will uh, provide their uh, resource that um, students can uh, call or, or text information to because it is, it is serious. The mental health uh, of our students and our communities is really having, a, being impacted by uh, this isolation and um, students not being able to go see their friends. We, we cannot minimize the impact of mental um, health. And, and July happens to be Minority Mental Health Awareness Month as well. But Teen Helpline is one of the ones I have, happen to have at my fingertips as a resource. So definitely um, go on the azed.gov uh, website and there are some resources there as well. You know, if I can hop in real quick, just from the school perspective, I know within Osborne, we have integrated school-based services um, through partnership with Valle del Sol um, that are able, that um, have counselors on our school sites that will still be able to, even in school closure. Um, they did from March through May and we'll be able to, in, into next school year, provide um, continuing services for our students and families, um, as well as, we can't forget about our teachers. Um, so workshops focusing on taking care of teachers, empowerment tools for them so they, they can foster calmness and mindfulness and, and self-care um, within the classroom. Um, we're also very fortunate to have received um, funds through the Arizona Department of Education uh, over the past year to, to be able to hire social workers within all of our schools, um, as well as most schools have psychologists. So if there are different levels, I would, I would encourage that parent that asked question to go to their school and see um, what level of services from the school psychologist to per the potential for um, either social workers or counselors that may have been hired through the school safety grants or if there are any partnerships for um, integrated school-based services that happen to be um, in your district. That's great information even for me you guys thank you. And, and additionally I wanted to bring attention to the um, the, it's now mandated that teachers are receiving uh, suicide prevention training. And so we have provided uh, that training online and it has been free for teachers. Um, so that's information that I can uh, get out because there's a code um, that has been provided so that teachers can take the training uh, online. Thank you. Thank you. That would be helpful. Um, and thank you everyone for that very thorough uh, response. Very helpful. It's about a trying time for everyone. Um, speaking of, of teachers, what protections will be in place for teachers who have underlying conditions and compromised immune systems? Will they be forced to engage in in-person instruction? What options may be in place for them? Um, and Ms. Garcia, I'd like to make sure that uh, you have an opportunity to answer this question and then we'll open it up for whoever else would like to. Sure, so what we're um, hearing across the state is that there is a variety of opportunities that are, are happening. What, what we're afraid of is that there is a mandate for anyone to enter a building if they are immune compromised or if there's a potential that they could get ill. And so, um, there are some there are some schools that are uh, districts that are asking teachers to come into the building to virtually teach um, and we're hoping that we can ask for flexibility at a local level and, and not mandate that there are some teachers who would like to come in um, and and be in their classroom be in their space and virtually teach um, but what there there are laws set up to protect people and and our union worked really hard in the spring to make sure that if people got ill they had the appropriate um, uh, leave that was used so that it would not be counted against them. Um, we would never ever put anyone in harm's way and, and that's part of what the union um, would, would do is support those teachers who felt that they would be put into a situation like that. I'm sure Dr. Robert. Yeah, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but you know, being in the schools, I, I guess I can, um, can speak to that. Um, right now, you know, we started with surveying our teachers um, just to see if there's anyone that's immunocompromised. 
Um, and so those surveys were filled out by, by all of our employees and anyone that um, mentioned that they, they do have a compromising um, condition um, is, is there's one-on-one -on -one conversations with our human resources department with each of those individuals, first starting with what types of accommodations um, may, be, may they be requesting. Um, some of that could be um, through choosing to um, teach at the, um, in the virtual academy within the, the school, but it could be that we have more people seeking to, um, to teach at the in the virtual setting than there are positions, and we can't necessarily have that be the accommodation, um, because if we're gonna offer accommodations, those need to be universal that we're, we're able to offer to everyone. So it's a, a very difficult question to look through, um, but we need to make sure that um, all of those conversations are had on an individual level with, with teachers. You know, one of, one of them, and this isn't an immunocompromised question, there's just fear right now of coming back into environments that we're not really sure what this is gonna look like and feel like. Um, and so, you know, there, there are physical um, issues that, that we're dealing with, and then there's just the emotional side of um, this great unknown that we're going into. Um, but it, it starts off with a human resources um, question. And then like Marisol was, was mentioning, the flexibility um, that staff members are asking for and how they're able to do some of these virtual assignments. So those are, those are questions that every district is wrestling with right now. And um, hopefully all, also working with uh, your associations, your teachers associations. Um, for every single one of our task forces, there was Osborne Education Association members that were representatives of those task forces. So hopefully, um, you know, you're seeing Marisol with, with your organization, you know, from the larger organization that um, the individual districts are, are involving um, teachers in the process. Um, but the answer is there, it, it doesn't seem like there are any easy for sure answers. Um, the heart of the question is more people want local control. Thank you, thank you both. Um, once, here's another question. Uh, once we are physically back in school, are parents or staff going to be asked to sign a document to not hold the districts accountable? Um, Ms. Maxwell or Dr. Robert or whoever would like to jump in. We do not have any such document that we're asking. Yeah. But that's not the case across across the state. Wow. I was going to say we've um, encouraged our members not to sign that. And as a parent, I, I, I don't feel comfortable signing that. Mm. Yeah, that would definitely be at the local level. Good question, though. Thank you. Thank you. How will COVID financial resources be shared across schools? Some schools do not receive much fun, as much funding as other schools or districts. How will it be ensured? How will you ensure it is fair and equitable? So we have uh, spent quite a bit of time on the CARES funding and, and ensuring that it is equitable, equitably distributed uh, across the state. Uh, and so there was a formula that um, included uh, Title I, and it's similar to Title I funding. Um, that was in, taken into consideration, but it's not the same as Title I funding. Um, we took in uh, many factors and components, and I would have to pull it up to uh, remember all of those, but there was careful consideration um, as far as how we would decide uh, to distribute the funds um, and make sure they were distributed uh, equitably. And some districts have already uh, tapped into some of that funding. This is, this is gonna be, um, from the department, it it's seems a, a very equitable um, distribution of these dollars. This question is way bigger than CARES dollars. Um, this is something that voters out there need to be thinking about as they're thinking about who's gonna go into their legislature and who's a friend of public education. I'm fortunate to uh, work within the Osborne School District. Um, we've been able to pass bonds and overrides. We're a one-to-one. -one. We were able to give Chromebooks for every single one of our students this coming school year. Very fortunate to be able to do that because we've passed overrides. 
that's not the same situation that can happen. It should not be dependent on your local community to decide to tax themselves more as to whether or not you're gonna be able to provide equitable educational opportunities for students. So this goes way beyond CARES dollars. This comes to you thinking about who's a friend, public education and looking for a, a, an equitable funding formula for public education outside of that arena. And when you go to the ballot box this November and are deciding who's gonna be in the state legislature. Thank you. We've had a couple of different questions regarding social distancing. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of uh, compile those. So uh, how will schools enforce or maintain social distancing? Classroom sizes are already large. Uh, and I think uh, Ms. Garcia spoke to that earlier, that there are already so many children in classrooms. And then you also have to consider hallways, bathrooms, and especially with younger children. How will that, how will social distancing actually be maintained? Will there be negative consequences for the children in order, in order to enforce it? And is it realistic that schools can do that with the funding that they currently have? You want to answer a, a little bit? big question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Feel free um, to jump in, whoever. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why you're seeing a lot of teachers having extreme anxiety and it's it, because it is a very difficult question to try to figure out. Um, science teachers, CTE teachers, kindergarten teachers, students share resources. So um, not only are we talking about physically, how are you going to do it in a classroom? Um, but then how are you going to maintain it in a positive manner so that um, everyone understands the impacts. I think as a teacher, the first thing I would, would do is try to build community in my classroom so that we can have a conversation about how everybody's action impacts each other, which is a broader conversation that teachers should be having with students, um, but even more so reinforcing all the CDC guidelines. I think social distancing in the classroom is, is really why so many teachers have anxiety because none of us have a classroom of 11 to 12, none of us. Um, and which is why you see districts trying to be creative with A and B days and hybrid days and trying to limit the amount of humans in a building so that there's less spread. Um, and why you're seeing so many districts deciding to um, not have in person for the next till October. So several districts came out today saying they're not going to have it until it's proven safe um, until after the first quarter. So these are hard discussions like um, Dr. Robert said, like, this keeps us up at night because there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of responsibility across the board. Absolutely. Uh, if anyone else would like to jump in, feel free or we'll move on to the next question. Will, this is regarding masks. And uh, sorry, I'd like to just pause for a second before I ask that question. It is after six o'clock. And so I'd like to thank our panelists who have agreed to stay on a little bit after six uh, because we do have so many questions. Even so, we won't be able to get to all of the questions. So I'd like to remind our participants that we will follow up and we will, with you and we will also share the questions with the panelists so that they can reach out to you uh, to answer your questions. Um, so this question is about masks. Will teachers be required to wear masks? And will there be a mandatory mask policy added into the dress code policy for high schoolers or, or for any age? And will the nurse or office have masks available for students in case they don't have one that day or they forget it or they spill something on it? Whoever would like to, please feel free. If I can hop in real quick. Um, Yes, uh, mass face, face coverings are going to be mandatory for everyone on campus, students, teachers. Um, we've already purchased about 30,000, you know, we're a district of 2,850 kids. Um, we've already purchased about 30,000 uh, disposable face masks, about 5,000 face shields. Looks like this, it's a face shield um, for students or teachers. Um, we'll, we'll give the choice of wearing either the face mask or the face shield, um, but it will be mandatory um, if you're on campus, absolutely. And it will be provided, the face shields will be provided for um, students and teachers. If, if uh, parents want to send in their child with their own face mask, 
um, for face covering, that's fine. Um, but for anyone that forgets it, um, at the entry of the school will be disposable face masks. And that includes anyone coming into the office. No one can come into the office to talk with uh, front office staff without having a face mask on. Great, thank you. And Ms. Maxwell, is it your understanding that that will be consistent across the state or Ms. Garcia? You know what, I, I would be honest with you. I am not, I know the CDC guidelines um, requires, and, and I know there is added protection about who's on campus once it becomes in person. There is, there are very uh, strict guidelines that have to be followed. Um, and so I'll be honest with you, I. I'm thinking that yes, masks are are definitely uh, part of the CDC guidelines, um, and I know that schools too are determining uh, people can and cannot come on campus. My understanding, uh, my understanding is that up until the cities were able to make that decision, a lot of districts were making it on their own and then the cities made the decision. So they're, they're going with the city um, and, and district rule to make those dis decisions. But I think as this virus evolves, it's becoming clear and clear that it's one of our first lines of defense for us to protect um, the children that we serve. And so um, that kind of, we move past that conversation and people are a little bit more accepting of that, that that needs to happen. Thank you. Um, and now we have a question for Ms. Beal. What does, it's a, it's a couple of questions I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, loop together. What does School Connect Arizona do to provide Wi-Fi to urban communities, especially with large school districts with a diverse group of students? What do you plan on doing to address the digital divide? Um, and then a couple of others. What is being done for families that cannot afford internet services and how can people best support School Connect? Uh, <clears throat> we're working with uh, providers um, and community partners who can help fund <clears throat> hotspots, um, help fund that $10 a month payment <clears throat> that might be there for an internet provider. We're also working with community partners who would be willing to open their doors to provide free internet during certain times of the day so that students might be able to go there, you know, after school, or if there's a hybrid model, they might have other areas that they could go that would be safe uh, for them to be able to use internet. So all of the partners, businesses, nonprofits, foundations, we would love to invite any of you who really have a heart for how important this is to come and connect with us. And we'd be happy to, to uh, bring that to local schools and the urban context. Um, there's also the potential of working together to create mesh networks. So that's actually turning Wi-Fi outward out of a building and creating kind of a neighborhood of internet. Um, and so we're working on all those different levels and every community is a little bit different but we do have the ability to bring those partners together to help that happen. And, and I do want to mention, thank you so much, um, that the superintendent, uh, Superintendent Hoffman started the technology task force. Uh, I think this is the third week. I think they've met twice. Uh, correct me um, if I'm wrong, but in yeah. response, yeah. So in response to this, because it is an issue of inequities, um, and one of the things I need to also state is that the work in, in regards to um, access uh, began, and it's the E-rate program, and, and many people, um, when I'm, I'm sharing this, are unaware that the E-rate program is an, a broadband initiative, and have, they receive funds um, from the federal government to ensure that, first of all, it's not just the hardware, it's the actual, it's not just the access to the hardware, it's the actual broadband. There are many remote, <laughs> rural remote places in uh, this state, and when we talk about uh, the access, we have to consider the broadband piece of it, which is huge. Um, and so there has been some, there has been progress made in this area, 
Um, and most recently in uh, Pima County, um, and I forgot what area, I want to say um, Pima County in the Gila River area, there has been a success with getting the library and the community, uh, the broadband uh, portion of it so that once you get a computer or hotspot that you have access uh, to broadband. So broadband access is a huge portion of why there is no access to um, internet connection. So we have to consider that and this work actually began and has been um, happening prior to this. And I should probably say that the Commerce Authority is working with amazing organizations all across the state of Arizona to actually deal with infrastructure, exactly what you're saying, Erica. Um, and, and that's very encouraging. There's CARES Act money that is coming to specifically address that issue. Um, and, and there are very creative solutions um, all over the, the state. And again, it's the, the areas of the rural and also the tribal lands that getting broadband to them is a huge challenge, which is a different challenge than high poverty urban areas where really it's more funding and trying to get that access available to everybody. And, and the whole thing is needed, right? And, and I think you know, what I would like to say is that it's going to take the entire community to support schools they shouldn't have to do this all on their own right everybody should be gathering around schools which are the hub of the community as, as dr roberts said so that you're able to say okay all the needs of of kids whether it's ppe whether it's food whether it's computers internet whether it's social emotional support all of that is needed for those schools and and a school connect is really just positioned to be able to bring those partners together always keeping the educator in the seat to say, what is it that we need? Uh, but then to access those resources uh, for our kids to be successful and, and for teachers and for parents, really, it's the entire ecosystem of the school. Thank you. We'll just take one more question here before we sign off for the evening. Thank you again to the panelists. My son is autistic and since COVID-19, I have seen great regression in his socializing and communication skills. In May, we made his IEP for the upcoming school year under the assumption that the students would be returning to school on campus. So my question is, how can we improve the services for students on IEPs and ensure that school districts take into consideration how special education students may struggle more with social isolation and not being physically on campus? For whoever would like to, to respond, Dr. Robert or Ms. Maxwell? That, I mean, that, that's just a huge question and I, I feel for you, we miss having students on our campuses. Um, I don't know what district you're in, but if you're in Osborne, we miss your child um, and being able to, to serve them um, with all of our professionals that know how to meet those specific needs. But in the way that you wrote that IEP, it may be that, it's, that you need to revisit if we can't come back and we stay in a virtual setting. Even though we're in a virtual setting, we have an obligation to provide that free and appropriate public education to every single child. And so that needs to happen, whether it's virtual or whether it's in, uh, online or in person. Um, so work with your, you know, uh, you're going to be starting off probably for the first few weeks, maybe even the first month um, in a virtual setting. So I would be calling your principal um, or school psychologist and making sure that the things that you set up in that IEP in May, if you're starting virtually, that, that, those, um, that those needs are, are able to be taken care of. Um, and then when we get back into the school setting, of course, you, you're, you've already made those steps and, and prepared for that. Um, I know within Osborne, we are, are definitely working with our special education staff um, to make sure that we're able to have virtual small group settings um, and, and lessons. Um, trying to make, we, you, the impossible has been asked of public education and we've responded. Um, and I think we've done it beautifully and I'm so proud of the educators 
um, across this country for the way that, that we've come through and built an airplane while flying it. Um, and we will find ways to accommodate and make sure that we're meeting the needs of, of your children um, in, in ways that we may not even realize that we're capable of yet. Um, but, but work with your school district, work with the teacher, work with the psychologist and the principal. And hopefully the response that you get is the one that your child deserves and has a right to. I would add also to um, ensure that your child is, that you're communicating with your child's case manager through DDD. And if you don't have one, um, you should. And so work with your pediatrician to ensure that your child's getting all the therapies that they can get um, at home if they can't get them at school. Absolutely, just to piggyback quickly, compensatory services have not been waived um, during this pandemic. So that's really important to know as a parent um, as a, uh, a parent uh, with students that need um, have an IEP. So um, definitely contact uh, your child's teacher in school. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, to our panelists and to our attendees, that is all the time we have for questions. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight and, and for staying on some extra time so that we could get to more questions and, and respond thoroughly to, to people's concerns. Um, again, for those of you who did not get your questions answered, we will be responding to them via email. Um, or if you have follow-up questions, please note the contact information on your screen. Our email is, is az07services at mail.house.gov. And with that, we wish you all a safe and healthy evening, and please reach out with any questions. Thank you again to the panelists. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Thank you.